and welcome to this final session for this week's History Fest, History Fest 2022. Uh, I'm here today with Dr Sean Lang, who will be talking to us about the British Empire. Uh, we are recording this session, so just so you know when we come to the end, if you want to ask any questions, you can unmute and also turn your camera on and ask us any questions, but you will appear in the recording. Otherwise, you'll just be able to pop any questions that you might have in the chat and then I can read them out to Sean and he'll answer them for you. So over to you, Sean. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Sean Lang, a lecturer in history here at Anglia Ruskin. Um, with a topic like the British Empire, um, I need to make it quite clear inevitably that we're going to be dealing with issues about race and about sort of uh, the, the language and attitudes of the time which would be difficult nowadays but of course that's the nature of history and in particular the history of a, of a topic like this but just so that you're aware um the british empire was huge um at, the, at its height which was actually in the 20th century which often surprises people um it covered about a third of the surface of the globe now what that means from the point of view of you as students and indeed of me as, as a lecturer is that there's an awful lot to cover um, and normally when people are doing uh, uh, this for a level they tend understandably to concentrate on one particular part of the empire you know, like India say or a particular part of Africa or whatever it might be <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is in two parts the first part is a sort of survey of the whole story of the empire so that you can see to some extent where what you've done fits into the wider story and then the second part is more about um if you like my interpretation of trying to explain what happened because i think it's very important that we treat the british empire the way you would treat any other historical topic as something that happened something that poses challenges for us in terms of understanding what happened and above all of course understanding why it happened and and the key here and in most historical topics it's not a problem but there are some and this is one of them where it is is to avoid caricature because people are not usually caricatures um they're complex characters and they're com and they have all sorts of a uh, different size to them and often contradictory aspects to them so i'm going you know i want to look at one particular aspect which i think without caricature helps to explain what was going on so that's uh, essentially what i'm going to do so let me just share my screen um which should take you to this there we are <clears throat> now i hope you can see that can I just ask Sarah if you just to confirm you can see the slide? Yes, that's all fine. Thank you. Oh. I'll let you know if there's any problems. OK, right. So the first part, as I say, is a sort of um, a quick survey in terms of the chronology of the topic. And broadly speaking, uh, we're talking about three phases and you can see I've dated them there. The 16th to the 18th centuries, the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, very important point to make which is obvious when you think about it though people often don't think about it is that no one in the say the 16th century or the 17th century knew that they were in the early stages of the british empire that's something which you um look which you sort of come to if you like when you look back that's if you like uh, the exercise of hindsight it's what historians do all the time we always give labels to things that um, not only weren't used by the people at the time might not even have been uh, understandable to them um, but nevertheless, with hindsight and you know, with a topic like that, you can sort of broadly divide it into these three periods. So the first one is a period of trade, mercantile expansion, which takes the form of plantations and colonies. Now, a plantation um, nowadays is used for trees and plants, um, but actually in the 16th and 17th century was a word which was used for what we would call colonies. I mean, they use the word colony as well, but they often use the word plantation. The idea being that you're sort of planting people, um, as it were. Um, in actual fact, the first uh, area where English and Scottish people were planted, and that word was used, was Ireland. Um, and indeed, Ireland is a part of the story of the British Empire, though it often gets left out. Um, but the main ones that I suppose we're familiar with were over in what was then called, of course, the New World. In other words, North America, Jamestown, Virginia, um, which uh, uh, develops alongside with, uh, the plantations in Massachusetts for the North of the Pilgrim Fathers. And these are people who um, leave England for various reasons as it were, plant themselves on the other side of the Atlantic. And what they're going to do is 
just as they would have done in England, which is to have sort of an economic way of making a living. Um, but of course, much of that is going to depend upon trading, um, trading back to England or possibly to other parts of the world. The East India Company was similar to that in that it too was a trading company, but the difference was that the climate and the political situation in India did not encourage the Europeans to plant themselves. So um, in America, where there's a much more congenial climate and the uh, the local civilization was much less uh, sort of sophisticated and, and, and developed um, than, uh, than the one in India. There you do get colonists. In the East India Company, you get a sort of commercial presence which develops in time into a military one. Um, but they're all part of what we would recognise as the same story of commercial expansion. In other words, the story in the 16th and the 17th and the 18th century is principally about trading and conquering areas comes as a sort of uh, byproduct of the central activity, which is trading. Then you come through to the 19th century, and this takes us into what I suppose we would normally think of as the main period of the British Empire. And I put here imperial power and confidence. And the difference between the earlier period and the 19th century is really what you're looking at there, which is Britain's development as an industrial manufacturing centre. And of course, for a long time, from the end of the 18th century to, to certainly for much of the first half of the following century, um, Britain is almost the only industrial manufacturing country uh, in the world. And this gives the British an enormous advantage over the other European countries, but also, of course, it gives it uh, an increasing advantage over non-European peoples. And without that industrial basis, you couldn't really have the sort of contrast that you're looking at here. This is a picture from, um, by the look of it, sort of late 19th century, um, possibly even early 20th century, but I think it's more likely sort of 1880s, 1890s, um, in Africa. Um, and um, you know, there are all sorts of imperial themes in this particular picture. You see the Europe, you see the two British people. Notice that they're wearing European clothes, I mean lightweight ones, but European ones. I'll come to the hat, the head, the headgear a bit later on. Um, and of course, they're sitting down very much in a position of command and confidence. When they've got their servants standing around them, if you look at this chap over here, look how stiff he is in front of the camera. Um, and the real contrast is between these two sitting at ease, look at his cup of tea in their chairs, and the chap over here squatting on the ground. And there you have a real sense of the cultural difference and of course the assumption of cultural superiority. None of that would have been possible had it not been for the industrial strength that 19th century Britain and of course the Western world in general gradually developed and it enabled them to exercise that sort of power over literally millions and millions of people. And as that 19th century develops and as Britain's power, uh, its economic power, its political power, its military power um, develops. I mean, really, you can say that the 19th century is sort of Britain's century. So there develops um, a, quite an interesting idea. And we're here talking about the 1880s and with this particular image and certainly through through the 90s and then into the new century, the 1900s. Um, and it's an idea of what was called imperial federation. And that is to create what they used to refer to as Greater Britain. And that meant some sort of political union, they weren't quite sure exactly how, but of the, um, the settler colonies. So you'd have Britain, including Ireland, um, and you would have Canada and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa. And the point about all those areas was that they were all settler areas where there'd been plantations and colonies of white settlers. And you continue to get people emigrating to these parts of the world. And the, the idea was that these should form some sort of international federation, some, you know, maybe, you know, with one parliament for all of them, details, as it were, still to be worked out. And indeed, the real enthusiasts for this idea thought that the United States ought to be part of it as well. And there's an extra little detail that you might have spotted. Uh, and if you haven't, I'll tell you now, which is that all of these areas were white dominated. They have significant white populations and indeed were thought of as the white colonies. Um, and the other areas of rule, notably India, 
um, might or might not be part, be sort of central uh, to that. Though in fact, the, norm, the normal assumption was that they would be in a sort of subordinate role. <clears throat> Please excuse my voice, by the way, as you can hear, I've got a stinking cold. But, um, and this imperial confidence, really, where you have Britain um, almost carving up the world with itself on top, really reaches its height, um, very much attached to the monarchy. Um, Queen Victoria had been on the throne for 50 years in 1887, and when she was still there 10 years later, they had a second big party, a jubilee as it's called. And this particular one, the Diamond Jubilee of 1897, was made into a very, very big celebration of the empire. And indeed her title, as you can see on that um, plate, um, on the right hand side, it says Queen of England. And in case you're wondering what about the rest of Britain, uh, in Victorian times, it was very common to use England to mean what we would refer to as Britain or indeed the United Kingdom. And on the left, you have her other title, which was that of Empress of India. And it's just a little taste of the imperial theme that was given to the particular celebrations in 1897 for 60 years of Queen Victoria on the throne. Um, our present queen in uh, 2022 uh, is, uh, has, a, has overtaken Queen Victoria and, and uh, it all being well is, is likely to celebrate her platinum jubilee um, for 70 years on the throne. And no one's matched that, not even Queen Victoria. And so by the time of the sort of end of the 19th century and the 20th century, there is a real confidence about Britain's um, view of itself and its imperial role. And I think it's nicely summed up in this picture that I found with all the, the flags there. Well, these are the flags of the different dominions. Uh, the dominion is, is one of the self-governing settler, in other words, white settler colony. So you have the British Union Jack in the middle, you have the crown, of course, and then the various ones, that's Canada there, uh, your recognised Australian flag there. Um, and here they all are, as uh, as you see, united we stand for faith, king and empire. This is because it's for um, Edward VII, who was Queen Victoria's son and successor. And in fact, historians do talk about a sort of cult of the Union Jack at that sort of time. Just to give you a little bit of context for this, this is the uh, period when Edward Elgar, so Edward Elgar the composer, writes his famous uh, pomp and circumstance marches. And if the name doesn't mean anything to you, um, you might well know one of the most famous tunes from it, which is Land of Hope and Glory. Still sung, of course, at the last night of the proms. And that sort of very exuberant, very um, confident um, faith in, in, in Britain. Um, notice, you know, faith, king and empire, which of course means um, faith in God, and land of hope and glory. Uh, people often just use the title without thinking about what it means. But faith, hope, glory, these are religious ideas. And there was this idea that Britain's empire was a massive force for good and that it enjoyed the support of God. And that almost the proof that it enjoyed the support of God was how big it was. Otherwise, you know, how could it have got uh, been so successful? Um, so there is a real faith. And I think that's one of the most important differences between them and us that we need to take on board. Um, if you have, as many people do nowadays, an overwhelmingly negative view of the empire, it can be very difficult to understand people who, living at the time, had an overwhelmingly positive view of what they were doing. Um, and somehow you have to sort of um, put your own thoughts to one side and try to see it through the eyes of the people at the time and understand what they thought that the empire was doing and what they were standing for. <clears throat> the biggest shock that the empire got was right at the end of the 19th century. Uh, in fact, it began in the autumn of 1899 and went on just over into the new century and was finally wrapped up in 1902. And this is the Anglo-Boer War. It's often referred to simply as the Boer War, referred to at the time as the South African War, and strictly speaking, the second Anglo-Boer War, because there had been a very brief earlier one a couple of decades earlier. Um, it was a war between the British Empire and two um, states in Southern Africa um, run by uh, what were originally Dutch settlers, often referred to as Boers, which means farmer, um, and they were called the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. It was a long drawn out war. It's a story for another day, and indeed some of you may have studied it in detail. The point about it, the reason I'm including it here, is that this is the first time really that the British have a crisis of confidence. 
I've been stressing the confidence of the 19th century phase. And in the Boer War, they, are, um, they suffered some very, very serious military defeats. They also discovered that a lot of their uh, volunteer soldiers were medically unfit because of the conditions in the British cities in which they'd been brought up. And over, you know, in, in a whole range of ways, the Boer War seemed to show the British uh, um, Empire that perhaps they weren't quite as all powerful as they had imagined and possibly, and this was even more worrying, possibly they weren't even quite as virtuous as they had imagined because some of the methods um, that were used in the Boer War, of which the, the most notorious were camps where civilians were taken away from their homes and concentrated under guard. Um, and this is why they were called concentration camps. Um, I don't want you to think, oh, this sounds like Auschwitz or something like that. They weren't extermination camps. They weren't um, in the way that the Nazis, they weren't camps of the sort the Nazis were to run later. But they were nevertheless very badly run with uh, an appalling death rate from mainly from disease and malnutrition and sheer criminal neglect. And this was what led the leader of the opposition in Parliament to say that Britain was using, and this is a phrase which I ask you to remember because I'm going to come back to it, methods of barbarism, suggesting that Britain, the British Empire, and this is the leader of the British Liberal Party, that the British Empire was using methods of barbarism in the war in South Africa. Remember that phrase, we're coming back to it. And then um, you reach something which will be very familiar to you, the out outbreak of the First World War in 1914. And I'm very sure that you're familiar with this image of Lord Kitchener pointing and encouraging people to, uh, to join up for the army. You might not immediately see what it's got to do with the British Empire, but I'll point a couple of things out to you. Um, notice, noticeably that it doesn't tell you who the man is. It assumes that you know, moreover, that his pointing finger is enough on its own to get you to join the army. Now, it's not the king. It's not someone representing um, John Bull or one of those characters who sort of um, symbolises the nation. It is very specifically Lord Kitchener. Who was Lord Kitchener? Lord Kitchener was a military man who had become a sort of something of a, a hero through his campaigns, guess where, in the empire. Um, and it's a sign, this, this very um, poster is a sign of how deeply ingrained faith in the empire was by 1914, that you only had to have a, an image of an imperial hero with his pointing finger, and that would be enough to get huge numbers of young men to join the army. And so indeed, of course, they did. So it's a it's normally taken, of course, as part of the story of the First World War, but it's also part of the story of the empire. And then we come to the 20th century, and as you can see, decline, retreat, decolonization. Uh, the long story of how Britain's empire went into decline, and it began the story began almost as soon as the First World War was over with a, a major uprising in Ireland, <clears throat> which indeed became a war of independence. And um, it was one which neither side could quite win. Um, but in 1922, um, Ireland was granted what was called dominion status, which meant it was self-governing. It was still part of uh, the empire, it was still under the crown but it was to all other intents and purposes, it was um, self-governing. Now, as a little twist, as I mentioned, that neither side could quite defeat the other, and a concession that the Irish had to grant was to allow uh, the, the areas of Ulster um, if, to opt out if they wanted to and to remain part of the United Kingdom. And six counties of Ulster did so and became Northern Ireland. And that, as I'm sure you're aware, even if you don't know the details, was to become a major source of contention in the years that followed. Nevertheless, the loss of um, so much of the very first of England's colonies, Ireland, um, was the beginning and certainly a sign of a, of a sort of period of decline for Britain's empire during the 20th century. And then the Second World War, um, more than anything else, really sort of knocked the blow uh, against the empire from which it could not recover. And the biggest symbols, not the only example, but certainly the most powerful symbol of this was the surrender of the major Britain, British naval base at Singapore to the Japanese in 1942. And the photograph you're looking at here shows the British commander who is holding the uh, Union Jack and some of his officers, one of whom is holding a large white flag, marching to, uh, to, to talk with the Japanese commander to negotiate the surrender. Now, 
anyone suffers some defeats at times. Um, the British Empire had suffered defeats, uh, you know, all the European empires had suffered defeats at one time or another. But, the sur but uh, it's one thing to lose a battle, to surrender is more humiliating. <clears throat> Moreover, Singapore was a very important symbol of British power. So this had a huge um, impact, not just in terms of showing the British could be defeated, but in many ways what it did was to destroy the image that the British had developed of themselves as a people who were always superior. And here they were surrendering not just to anyone, but to an Asian power. And then the end of the war, and particularly, of course, the end of the war with Japan <clears throat> in 1945, is well known because it brought the atomic age in. And this, the atom bomb, of course, was dropped um, twice on Japan. But the power that did that was the United States. And a few years later, another power showed that it had atomic weapons too, and that was the Soviet Union. And as I put on there, in this new age of atomic superpowers, what place was there for these old style European empires, which still existed, um, the British and the French and the Dutch and the Portuguese um, and so on? And the answer effectively was not much of a place at all. Um, so only a couple of years after the end of the war, um, Britain was forced, and let's be quite clear about it, was, was forced to give up uh, control of India. And India really was its biggest symbolic overseas possession. Um, and that's a, a major sign that the days of the British Empire are now numbered. And the humiliation for Britain and its empire came in 1956 at the time of the Suez Crisis. Briefly, the, uh, the Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, um, authorised uh, a British invasion of Egypt in order to seize control of the Suez Canal. But it was done illegally. It had no international support um, and it was disowned by the Americans. And indeed, the Americans used their financial um, power to force Britain to pull its troops out. It was a humiliation. Um, for Great Britain, and it really was a sign that the old days of 19th century Victorian confidence and imperial sort of uh, uh, posturing were well and truly over. And <clears throat> although the story of the empire wasn't yet over, but the um, controversy um, was effectively to sort of force Britain out. This is a, a striking image from Kenya, or Kenya, as it was pronounced in the days of the empire, uh, when there was a, a major uprising um, by a, a group known as Mau Mau. And uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of controversy about the methods that the British used in fighting against Mau Mau. Um, and indeed, <clears throat> similar accusations to those from the Boer War. In other words, the British Empire using what had been called methods of barbarism. I'm talking here about torture um, and uh, in, uh, illegal detention and so on. In the post-war period, the empire was sort of evolving into the modern day Commonwealth. And indeed, the Commonwealth itself um, you know, is, is one of those bodies which, whose existence and usefulness and role is always under, under question, because what place is, the, is there for the Commonwealth in the modern world? Not always an easy question to answer, but certainly it's a sort of echo of the empire in which um, the monarchy has a central role, but Britain itself doesn't necessarily. There were still one or two little sort of last gasps. The Falklands War, which took place in 1982, 40 years ago this year, um, was indeed a sort of last war of empire. The Falklands Islands were a British colony, uh, populated, of course, by British people. And that was the basis on which the uh, counter invasion took place, um, rather than calling it an, a war for a colony. <clears throat> and finally, in 1997, the last British colony of any real worth, which was Hong Kong, um, was uh, finally brought to an end. And of course, in that case, um, rather than sort of handing over to the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong people, as it were, as an independent country, um, instead, what happened was that it was handed to China, um, handed back to China. Um, but it, it's a slightly different um, uh, way of ending. So <clears throat> that's a quick overview of the story in its three phases. Now we come to the historian's question, because you've got to explain it somehow. What led the British to do this, to rule so much of the world? If you like to, if I can put it in this way, what were they thinking of? It's not something I suspect that we would want to do today. I, when I say we, I'm thinking really of people in you know, modern Britain. I mean, there might be people in other parts of the world, certainly rulers who, who might dream of such things. <clears throat> but on the whole, the days of, of empire, certainly of European empire, are in the past. So 
why did they do it? And this is what I this is why I come to what I was saying at the beginning about trying to avoid caricature, because if you take the view that it's essentially a very a bad story, then it's very easy to say, well, they were villains, um, or that they were just eaten up with pride or greed, economic greed. What they just wanted was profit. <clears throat> um, I'll come to the racism in a minute. Well, the trouble with that is that you, although you can um, certainly find examples of villains and people eaten up with national pride and certainly find examples of uh, economic greed. It will never do as an explanation for everything. You can also find examples of the exact opposite. You can find examples of self-sacrifice. You can find examples of, of considerable virtue rather than villainy. They, they will ex these words will explain part of the story, but not the whole thing. And actually, that's true of the next two. Um, at the moment, what people often assume that the whole story is essentially one of racism, <clears throat> because there were undoubtedly um, racist attitudes that one finds in looking at the British Empire. But again, it's not consistent. And there are plenty of exceptions and sort of modifications to that. So that although I would never, never deny that racism is there, I don't think it works as an explanation of the whole story. Then you get people who say, well, colonialism shows a propensity for violence. And they very often like to use the word violence. They'll talk about colonial violence and, <clears throat> and violence being used to support colonial rule and so on. Well, violence is another word um, for force. <clears throat> In other contexts, you know, people tend to use talk about the resort to force rather than violence. And the point of the, the difference between the two is because they mean much the same thing. Is that violence is a word that you're disapproving of. Whereas you can um, sort of uh, accept the, the need sometimes for the use of force. So there's a bit of moral positioning, if you like, I think, when people use the word violence. Um, but certainly there, there was a propensity for violence in various of the colonial areas. But my point is that you find that elsewhere as well. And it's not the whole story. Um, none of these, it seems to me, are quite sufficient as an explanation. So I've, that's why I put another concept. Now I must stress this is my uh, take on it. You don't have to go with it, but I'll explain why I think it's this. It's the concept of civilization. Now, the word civilization, which of course is one that we're familiar with, has its origins in Latin. And it comes from the idea, um, the, the Latin uh, kiwis or kiwitas, which is uh, a citizen <clears throat> or a, a sort of uh, a citizenate. Um, it's linked to the Greek word polis, which or, which basically a sort of city state. <clears throat> and the idea of the link between these words and civilization is that when you live in a permanent settlement, particularly large permanent settlement, it, it is only possible to live if there are certain rules that everyone ob uh, observes. Otherwise, it just becomes impossible. Um, and that's why, um, I mean, from the, the, the Greek word, we get words like politeness and police. They all have the same root. They are they're different aspects of things you need in order to survive and in order to, to flourish in a settled community like a, a city, a polis, you know, or, a, or, you know, or using the Latin word. And civilization has the same idea. That is, it's the sort of code of living <clears throat> that you get from living in a city. Now, if you have concept of civilization, Almost by definition, you must also have a concept of the lack of civilization. If someone, when you describe someone as civilized, the clear implication is that someone else is uncivilized. And the word that the Greeks used for people who were outside their concept of civilization has given us the word barbarian. Now, the origin is um, the Greeks used to say that anyone who didn't speak Greek was just talking a lot of um, a lot of nonsense, and they would get you know, it's as if they were talking ba 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 like that, meaning you know foreign languages, not our language. And from that comes the idea that if you're foreign, you're barbarian. So you have the civilized and the barbarian, and it's absolutely key to what I'm going to say to you that I don't really think you can have the one without the other, because who describes themselves? basically as barbarian, who actually says, you know, come and join us, we're the barbarians, which itself indicates that there are some people who are not barbarian. It's a value judgment, in other words, barbarian, but so is civilised. Now, <clears throat> this I've taken you back to the ancient world, and that's very important because the people of the British Empire did compare themselves with people of the ancient world. Indeed, if you think about it, one of the most important lang uh, subjects that they studied at school was a language, Latin. Um, and indeed, I am one of the last generation to have done Latin at school. I did it for O-level. Very useful it was too. Anyway, um, 
And so they saw themselves, the, the British saw themselves as the inheritors, not of the barbarians, but of the Romans, of the civilized. So they identified, um, even against their own ancestors, if you think of the ancient Britons, they identified themselves with the Romans, who are the civilized ones, even when, as in this picture, they're being defeated and the people who are winning are still barbarians. Look, for example, at uh, the sort of neat, clean, cleanly shaven Roman down here. He might be on the ground. He might be about to be cut down, but at least he's uh, you know, he's properly groomed as opposed to this lot over here who look a complete shower. Um, <clears throat> and the Roman historian Tacitus actually did a description of the Germans, in other words, of the barbarians, which is quite important for our purposes today. He said, for their covering, a mantle is what they all wear, which is a sort of cloak, if you like, fastened with a clasp, or for want of it, with a thorn. As far as this reaches, uh, as far as this reaches not, they are naked and lie whole days before the fire. The most wealthy are distinguished with a vest, not one large and flowing like those of Sarmatians and Parthians, but girt close about them and expressing the proportion of every limb. In other words, barbarians don't know how to dress, indeed hardly know how to cover their nakedness. They likewise wear the skins of savage beasts, note the use of savage there, a dress which those bordering upon the Rhine, in other words, those closest to Rome, use without any fondness or delicacy, but about which such who live further in the country, further away from Rome, further away from civilization, are more curious, as void of all apparel introduced by commerce. They live beyond the reach of trade. Uh, and trade, of course, represents civilization. <clears throat> so the Romans had this very strong sense, not only that they are civilized and other people are not, but that the an idea of what uncivilized means, and it means you live almost in a savage state, almost like a sort of savage beast. Um, you don't know how to dress properly. And I don't just mean that you don't know <laughs> which, which uh, form of dress to wear for dinner, but I mean, you know, you don't know how to cover your body decently. <clears throat> now, the Roman style uh, is beautifully uh, captured by this particular um, pal um, temple in, in southern France, in Nîmes, called the Maison Carré, which means the square house. And to show you how the Roman idea was uh, taken up by later ages, this is the, the Vatican, St. Peter's in the Vatican, and there you see the sort of classical colonnade style. Um, and then still in the 18th century, this is, as you can see, is in America, Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, the third president and the uh, framer of the Declaration of Independence. And again, very much modelled on the Roman model and indeed inspired by that house in, in, in Nîmes. The uh, American um, Senate, uh, again, you see that style and in Cambridge, of course, you can think of the Fitzwilliam Museum, which has much the same sort of style. And although the dome would have been strange to the Romans, they wouldn't have known how to build that. But they'd have recognised the name which is given to this, not only Senate, which, of course, comes from ancient Rome, but Capitol Hill. Well, the Capitoline Hill was one of the hills in ancient Rome. So these are, the architecture here is just some very good visual evidence of just what a strong influence the Roman idea of civilization had on these, these later ages, the ones that we're studying. Or here, this um, book of polite behavior, very much a, a feature of 18th century life, um, very characteristic here, the various of these types of books of, um, and guidebooks to behavior. But again, coming from the idea that there's polite society, um, which takes its, its cue, if you like, from ancient Roman civilization. And by implication, if you have polite society, you have impolite society. If you have civilized behavior, somewhere you have uncivilized behavior. So you can't really distinguish the two. Now, what are the signs of um, good polite society, good civilized behavior? Uh, it's nicely encapsulated in um, various forms. This is a good one from the um, artist Hogarth. It's a story through various pictures of two apprentices. <clears throat> and here we have the sign of the good one. And he's hardworking and industrious and sober. And here we have the lazy one, um, who's going to get a beating, by the way. Um, and you see up at the top, it says industry, which is this one over here, and idleness, um, which is this one over here. And civilization is the world of industry, uh, hard work, soberness, and so on. And also in terms of religion. Now, obviously, the Victorians um, are uh, a very religious people. I know there's a lot of debate about this, but nevertheless, they certainly took religion seriously. And indeed, listen, general lesson for history, this, I think you should always take religion seriously at, at any time in history. 
But the sort of religion that the Victorians had was, if you like, a very civilised form, very controlled. And particularly what was controlled was emotion. They did not like religious emotion. Um, and they saw a much more sort of controlled, much more restrained approach to religion as the sign of a civilised society. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, in this very famous painting, which shows Queen Victoria um, presenting a Bible to a very splendidly and rather uh, sort of cliched uh, Af kneeling African prince here, the title of the painting is very important. It's called The Secret of England's Greatness. And that means both the monarchy and the sort of constitution in the background, because it's represented partly by Prince Albert, particularly these characters here, who are two leading politicians at the time, indeed the prime minister and the foreign secretary. But they're in the background. So the secret of England's greatness is the queen, um, the constitution sort of quietly in behind her and the Bible. And it's that sort of restraint as opposed to the much more dramatic style of the African. Um, and the thinking was that civilized people keep their uh, enthusiasms under control, whereas uncivilized people uh, allow religion um, and other forms of emotion to, to rule them. Now, what you're looking at here are the ruins of um, uh, the forum in, 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 in Rome, <clears throat> forum of, of ancient Rome. And this is a, a, a reminder that one thing that did haunt the British in the empire was the knowledge that the Roman Empire had declined and fallen. And of course, it had fallen to the barbarians. <clears throat> so this raised the question, is it possible for a civilization to decline? And of course, the unspoken bit of that was, if it is possible for a civilization to decline, might that happen to their own? India was a particularly good example to study. And what you're looking at here is, in fact, from his funeral monument um, at his college in Oxford, a memorial to Sir William Jones, who was a, a leading scholar of uh, Indian, as it says, um, law in particular, um, culture, but particularly law. Um, and what I'm getting at here is that there was a recognition, particularly in the 18th century, that India represented a very, very highly developed civilization, no question. And its laws were well worth studying, its religion well worth studying. And there were those scholars who did so. They're known as Orientalists because they studied what they thought of as the Orient. But on the other hand, there was no getting away from the fact that India, of course, had being taken over by the East India Company. Did that suggest that in some way a civilization like the Roman one as well could decline to the point where it would, could be taken over by barbarians? And in a sense, part of the clue to this conundrum which puzzled British was, um, was the way uh, Indian civilization treated women. And the most dramatic and controversial aspect was the practice of sati, um, normally written nowadays S-A-T-I, although in Victorian writings, you often see it spelt in the way I've put in brackets, and certainly that's closer to how it's pronounced. And this was the practice whereby an Indian widow, who might very often be quite young, would um, sacrifice her life by going onto the funeral pyre of her dead husband, very often a lot older than she was. And uh, the picture is, is dramatic enough, but of course, to get an idea, imagine going into the um, furnace at the crematorium with the dead body of your husband. That's effectively what this was. Um, the British made a lot of this, and there's uh, some controversy among historians about just how widespread the practice was, though it did certainly did exist. But the point I'm making is that this seems to suggest that Indian culture itself has some sort of uh, uncivilized aspect to it, and particularly relating to the role of women. All of which would suggest that, in fact, <clears throat> there's more than one way in which a civilization can fall to the barbarians, the barbarians you see in the picture there. It can be um, defeated in battle, uh, the sort of thing that did begin to happen to the Romans, or in some way it could lose its sense of moral virtue and purpose from within, the sort of thing I was just showing you there. So one way or another, civilizations are quite vulnerable. And that concept of falling to, bar to barbarism is a long lasting one. These are two First World War images, and they're both of them about Germany. Now, the Germans were regarded as a highly civilized people in the 19th century, a highly cultured people, the people of, of great music, of great poetry, of great opera. And yet, come the First World War, look at how the Germans are being presented as, uh, as barely human, um, um, 
getting into militarism like this sort of great ape here with this his culture and his great club and uh, and notice the, uh, the the woman in his arms and even here when it's not a like presented like a great gorilla <clears throat> you got the same sort of idea and notice that it says the Hun. They often refer to the Germans as the Hun. The idea being that the Hun were the peoples who had come from Central Asia, Attila being the most celebrated of their leaders, as the enemies of civilization, an uncivilized people bursting in upon on Europe and they're reviving the idea in the First World War for the Germans. So this idea of civilization versus barbarism um, continues right the way into the 20th century and it carries with it this fear that not only are you up against a barbarous enemy but that it might be possible for your own civilization to sort of deteriorate as clearly the German one had, as the Indian one had, um, and where might that danger come from? Now, what you're looking at here is an image of Columbus arriving uh, in the, uh, the Caribbean and, uh, and, and dealing with the native peoples there. This, this is obviously a European image. When the Europeans encountered the peoples of the um, what we call the West Indies, all thanks to them, they were horrified. First of all, they had all sorts of stories of them as cannibals there. You see, there's the barbarism. Um, that the, There were lots of stories, massively exaggerated, uh, overstated, and uh, with a very, very um, rather hysterical imagination. Now, stories of cannibalism are bad enough, but in a sense, even worse was the image you're looking at here. And it might not strike a, you as a bad image because it's just someone having a sleep in a, having a nap in a hammock. But it was the custom in the Caribbean islands for people to spend a lot of time, particularly in the heat of the day, in a hammock. And if you've ever lived in a very hot country, you'll know that taking time during the day to get some sleep is actually a very good idea. Think siestas in, in Spain or in Mediterranean countries. Um, but to the Europeans arriving, even when they were coming from Spain, this seemed to suggest that these people were not only bestial, but lazy. And all of this suggested that something or other had made them this way, and what might it be? Um, and this, incidentally, um, applied not only in the Caribbean, but also in Africa, or obviously uh, uh, another tropical uh, area. The Europeans were convinced that people in Africa also led lives of a sort of mixture of laziness and bestial practices. And this was why, I've just come, you can see that's a slave trade image. This is why when slaving um, gets underway and begins in the 16th century, there's no thinking along modern lines that this is a cruel thing to do. Insofar as people thought of it at all, it was seen as actually quite a good thing to do because you're removing people, indeed you're saving people from the sort of life that they clearly led in Africa, which was one of cannibalism and savagery and all the rest and laziness and all the rest of it, and putting them to good, hard, civilized work. Remember, industry and idleness. And that therefore, you know, if you did think about slavery, and it has to be said for them for much of the period, people didn't. <clears throat> but when, you know, if you did, you couldn't see anything wrong with it. It seemed to be an entirely good thing to be involved in. That's why you get people investing in the Royal African Company and investing in charitable works. The sort of thing that nowadays we find very difficult and we start wanting to pull their statues down and their monuments and what have you. But at the time, it wasn't really seen as a contradiction. It's only when the movement against the slave trade begins to get going, 1760s onwards, that people are pointing out the cruelty of the trade. And that's when you begin to get people having second thoughts. And a lot of that actually came from um, religious groups um, who had concern for the Africans as individuals rather than simply as a commodity. Now, that seemed to suggest that um, there's a danger, if you like, that the British people could end up doing something cruel, abandoning their civilised principles. And that sort of danger was also illustrated by someone like China, which also had very clearly a, a, a very highly developed civilization, but also had a reputation for cruelty. Um, so the certainly Victorians have an idea that you can look civilised but not actually be as civilized as you look. And China was a good example of that. <clears throat> now, what was it that caused people to become barbarous? What was it that caused them to become lazy? What was it that caused them to turn to cannibalism? What was it that caused them to turn to cruelty underneath their apparently civilized life? And the fear was that it was the sun. It was the impact and the effect of too much exposure to the sun 
And that, my friends, is why the Europeans started to wear this extraordinary hat. I don't know if you can see me uh, here, but uh, there I, I have one because I show it to my students that easy. And it's pretty much the same one you see there. It's called a solar topi. There are different versions. Um, there were sort of male and female versions and there were military versions and did come in different styles. But essentially the, the thinking was that that would not only protect you from sunstroke, it would protect your moral virtue, that too much sun would somehow corrupt you from inside and sap your moral virtue, which in a sense would make you less civilized. And again, the, um, the evidence for that was the idea that uh, the less civilized peoples, even if they appeared to, to have a veneer of civilization, were morally suspect. Many, there are many sort of tales of debauchery and sexual um, shenanigans going on in the East. The East had this sort of reputation for being a bit loose. Another sign, if you like, of moral depravity. <clears throat> This um, still comes from a film made in the 1930s, one of a number which were quite popular at the time, set in British India. This one's called The Drum. Uh, rather good adventure stories they were. But what I'm getting at here is that the actor on the right, who is indeed uh, blacked up, that was quite standard, um, is playing an Indian prince. Now, there you've got a nice formal dinner. You see the chap on the left who's obviously um, British and he's in full evening dress, white jacket rather than black. That's the only concession you make to the climate. And it all looks perfectly civilised. In actual fact, the chap on the right, not to be trusted, um, because this is this trope, this theme, if you like, of the smiling, suave, sophisticated, polite, um, courteous, apparently civilised Indian prince who actually is deceitful and untrustworthy and cruel. Similar sort of idea that I was saying that they had about the Chinese. Now, you could just say, well, all right, as long as you protect yourself from the sun, as long as you maintain your own sort of moral principles, then, um, you know, civilised and uncivilised, to use the terms, can live quite happily um, alongside each other, which is why I put this question on here. Is it safe to leave barbarians alone? And as you can see from the picture there, the answer is probably no, um, because just as the Romans had not been able to leave the Germans alone, and indeed the, um, the Germans under... Um, Gosh, his name's gone. Um, it'll come back in a few minutes. But the Germans invade Rome and sack the place um, in the in the fort, which is what the, what you're seeing in that rather dramatic um, children's picture there. <clears throat> Uh, so, indeed, in the time of the British Empire, it was thought uh, unsafe to leave barbarians alone. And a good example is the Zulus. This rather splendid picture here is from a, 1980, a, a remarkable 1980s a miniseries called Shaka Zulu, which is a little bit like Dallas meets, uh, meets Zulu or something like that, because it's basically it's a soap opera set, at the, set during the, uh, uh, the early 19th century in the Zulu kingdom. And some wonderful, wonderfully bitchy women characters getting at each other all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a fun watch. But the point is that in um, the famous Zulu War, which has been made famous really through film, um, actually what happened was that the British launched a totally unprovoked, aggressive invasion of Zululand. They had actually no particular quarrel with the Zulus. The Zulus had quarrels with the, the, the Dutch and the Dutch with them, but, but the Zulus didn't have a quarrel with the British. Why did the British do it? And this is why I go back to that idea um, of the different motives. Was it just villainy? Was it greed? Um, actually, although you can, you, know, you can make a case for those, but the real point was this feeling that it wasn't safe to have such a powerful, savage kingdom, of course, that's the sort of language that they use, on your borders, and that if you just left it there, it would do to you what the Germans have done to the Romans, and therefore you invade. And if that means doing something illegal, then so be it, as, as indeed they did. And so it comes um, <clears throat> down to... Um, Again, someone who's who's actually was controversial in his own lifetime and is still very controversial today, Cecil Rhodes. Rhodes was a good example of the sort of person that the empire really benefited. Um, he was really a sort of nobody. He was uh, a younger son of a clergyman from Bishop Stortford uh, with very poor health. But a couple of his brothers had gone to South Africa for the diamond mines and Rhodes uh, went and joined them. And to cut a long story short, he ended up controlling the entire diamond mines of South Africa. Very, very, very wealthy man. Uh, you're all students. When he was a student at Oxford, 
um, he had he used to sort of go into lectures with diamonds in his pockets and, and sort of bring them out. And on one occasion, he spilt them all over the floor. And you can imagine the scene as everyone started scrabbling on the floor to pick up the diamonds. This is the, what I mean. The empire carried um, all sorts of possibilities for enormous wealth. But look at what he says here. I contend that we are the first race in the world and that the more the world you inhabit, the better it is for the human race. If there be a God, I think that what he would like me to do is to paint as much of the map of African British red as possible. How on earth do we read that? Do we say, well, this, this man is a sort of black hearted villain, that he's a, a bigot, that he's a sort of nationalist, um, uh, you know, uh, expansionist. And all. all of that may very well be true. But it builds up to a sort of caricature. You're not really trying to get into his thinking. What did he think he was doing? That's the question. And what he thought he was doing was spreading civilization. And he had this very strong idea that British civilization was better than anyone else's. And if you believe that, then of course it makes sense that most of the world should be under your rule. Now, even at the time, because this is a, uh, a cartoon from the late 19th century. There were cynical views about this and of the sort that we would probably agree with. And as you can see, on the one hand, you have that when the Chinese are doing it to you, it's barbarism. When you do exactly the same to them, somehow that is civilization. That sort of very cynical comment is indeed entirely appropriate, very, very right. Um, and it's worth knowing that there were people pointing that out at the time. But I think the real moment when the faith in civilization as a concept, as a sort of Western um, uh, uh, monopoly almost, um, comes under the most serious challenge was in the First World War, when it was much harder to say that, you know, this, this, these are the civilized people of the world. This is the sort, this is what they do to each other. This is the sort of fighting that they engage in. The First World War makes that concept much more difficult to maintain, but it doesn't entirely go away. And I think I'm ending on this. In 1969, the BBC commissioned a uh, what became a celebrated TV series from the art historian Sir Kenneth Clarke, who's the uh, rather, I think it's fair to say, rather sort of um, proud of himself chap on the left um, in his tweed jacket and tie. Uh, and indeed, you can you can get it on, on um, uh, I think a lot of it's on YouTube where you can buy the BBC DVDs. Um, and the idea was that civilization existed. He didn't know how to define it, but he said he knows, he knew it when he saw it. And when you watch even the first episode of Civilization or read the first chapter of, of the book that went with it, within a fir the first few lines, he's making a contrast between civilization and barbarism. You see what I mean? You can't have the one without the other. More recently, the BBC revisited the idea with a series um, called Civilizations because Clark had only dealt with Western Europe and to some extent America. <clears throat> Whereas the three historians that they had there, David Olashoga, Mary Beard, the classicist in the middle there, and Simon Sharma, um, looked at different civilizations, which is why it has the plural title. But even though they were trying to sort of update the old idea that Sir Kenneth Clark had put forward, the start idea is still there that you have civilizations. And if you have civilizations, you might extend the definition of it to include some that maybe Clark wouldn't have included. And certainly um, the 19th century British wouldn't have included. But you're still excluding others who somehow don't come under the civilization banner. And that's why I would leave you with this question. <clears throat> See, I'm, you know, have we lost the concept of civilization and barbarism? And you can probably tell from the way I'm saying it, I don't think we have. I think we still have it. And as long as we have that concept that there is civilized, that there is civilized behavior, civilization, and there is its opposite, I'm not sure that we are so different from the imperialists. But that, of course, is something for you to discuss. Wow, well, um, thank you, Sean. That was uh, really, really insightful. And I think you chose some amazing images there that actually really brought it for life and also kind of uh, presented what some of the kind of issues and tensions are. Um, we've just literally got a couple of minutes left. If there are any questions for Sean, please do pop them in the chat. Sean, um, I just got a quick question for you, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, is the history of the British Empire over or is there another period of history for the British Empire that might be about atonement, so, you know, and what do you think that might look like, if so? Yeah, um, I think you're right, actually. I think you've, you've answered your own question. I think the period of what we think of as the story of the empire, which is trade and um, territory and what have you, yeah, that's pretty much over. I mean, there were one or two small areas left, like the Falklands, indeed. Um, but otherwise, you know, that story is pretty much over. But there then follows 
what you might call the intellectual um, empire, which is the sort of thinking in the head, um, the idea about yourself um, and your own part in the world. Um, and and it is you know, some people wrote a few years ago that the last bit of decolonization was in the British mind. Well, I think that process is is underway in a big way. And so all the decolonization debates that go on about teaching or about statues in the streets and so on, that's part of the the sort of end game, if you like, or the I don't know the sort of post empire um, story. Um, <clears throat> and I think that will go on because it's such an important part not only of our history but of our present our whole multicultural society um, and the particular nature of it most most of that not quite all but most of it is the product of empire and as that as the sort of the um consequences of that work their way through and we work out what does british mean that is still part of the you know the, the moving on part of the empire story and of course people made the link with brexit they said that uh, brexit was a sort of uh, uh, an echo if you like of people's um uh imperial imagery of what britain had been and therefore what it sh still should be so um although we might be uh free of much of the political role of empire i don't think we're free of its of its sort of echo at all i think that's going to reverberate for quite some years yet Possibly a slightly controversial uh, question, which you may avoid if you wish. Uh, do you think we need to remove British Empire from our language? So, for example, sort of OBEs and MBEs, which some people find difficult to accept because they believe that it's sort of buying into what the British Empire represented. Do you think that would mark a change oh, in point? I won't duck the question. Um, I think these things have their time and they that time does come to an end so i think probably yes or my, my instinct is is that um i i don't like it when people want to go in and make huge great sweeping changes um as it were just for the sake of it but i think you recognize that a chapter is over so um yes i think it does begin to look rather strange there was a time when the order of the british empire did mean something and, and the, the name was uh, was important but now it's, it's obe and um, but that is still what it stands for. Yeah, so I, th I, I don't like keeping the initials just for the sake of it. So order of British excellence, I think that's a bit naff. Oh. But <laughs> I, I think, uh, well, we'll end on that note. Thank you, Sean. There are, there are no um, questions in the chat for you. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. That was um, really great. And, and thank you for taking part in History Fest, especially as you've not been feeling too well. So I really appreciate it. You're Thanks very well. Thank you. Thanks for joining History Fest.